Even though I am not a propagation specialist, I, in addition to entomology, I also have a degree in environmental horticulture, and I've taken plant propagation and everything. And I asked that specific question, um, and I won't refer to you because you actually are doing the propagation. I just deal with bugs, so I normally say if it doesn't have six or eight legs, I don't deal with it. But when I was in Canada, I talked to a researcher because they were doing this, and they actually did a study where they trimmed leaves and they didn't trim the leaves. Because when I was in school, they standard teach you to do that, or they did 30 years ago. But they said on the cannabis that it actually slowed the rooting process. Um, and my other concern with the cutting is the sanitation and lack of, of cleaning your pruners. And every time you make a wound, you make an opening. And since we also have some viruses and microplasms and, and different things out there we don't know about, and we don't know how they're vectored yet, um, and we don't always know which are the option, best options for sanitizing tools. It just makes another pathway for things to get in. I actually, at one of my uh, facilities, we actually now uh, have one pair of pruners for each mother, and that gets tied to the plant. Uh, so we definitely don't move in between, and even then we have uh, sanitation liquid to dip them in, but each one stays with it because I have so many amazing pictures of dirty pruners laying around cannabis facilities that are never cleaned. And again, we don't understand the complete virus complex of what is out there and all the different pathogens. We don't know the vectoring methods yet, so you better be safer than sorry or biosecurity. And don't let you be the person, I come to your facility and take pictures and then put you up there. Because that's what you're gonna see tomorrow. So. But yeah, the basic take home from this, but again, research sometime when you take it to the real world and these guys have more experience doing it. But I asked that specific question and they said when they did a head to head for the cannabis, it was better not to trim them. So. If, if you have the space, it would be because you're leaving more material to source from. And I agree with the cutting creates opportunity for intrusion. But uh, the, the problem with doing propagation is it's expensive because you're having to run heating and lighting and rack space costs money. And so the more you spread your tray grids out, you become 50% less efficient right off the bat. So if I go from 100 tray to 50, I'm now half as efficient. We're not talking a little efficient. You used to make a buck, now you make 50 cents. So you have to kind of put that into your equation. That's the problem with cannabis for a lot of it is how much space. Not that you're having bigger operations with, with more canopy. But historically, you didn't have so much canopy to work with. And then even now, they're going into tissue culture holes so they can get away from having to have so much canopy. And it's just really a foundation of, can you afford to run the electricity? I think that's one of the considerations with real, with real propagation is that the cost of the production of it per square foot dictates some of your techniques. And I think it depends on what state you're in because of you know, Maine is very challenging because the number of plants you can grow where you go to Florida and there's all the space in the world. And so we can, you know, space them out and have what I would call more traditional horticultural propagation in prop trays under mist systems with um, under bottom heating and things like that. And we can space the plants. So it depends on the state and what the rules are on how they cost of energy. And the cost of energy. Next question. When, how about Wendy? Why don't you uh, say who you are, what you do? Let's let's do that. Hi, my name is Wendy Kornberg. Um, I run a small farm in Northern California in Humboldt County, and um, you know, my basic thing on this would be do it yourself and try it out and see what happens. I'm a huge proponent in collecting more data, and there are so many of us. If we can get everybody to start doing control groups and start checking it out, what works for me might not work for you. I found aloe to be phenomenal for cloning. And I've done side by sides. I did it with the purple gel, whoever does that with that clonex. <laughs> right, okay, so that stuff. And uh, I ran a, a, a whole, you know, easy, I use easy cloners. I don't like rock wool. I don't like Oasis cubes. I think they're very, very environmentally damaging no matter which process is used. I also end up with totes of that crap of things that didn't take. I'm not a very good cloner when it comes down to this. Aeroclones, I do phenomenal. I do great with them. So we did a chemical, traditional Clonex the whole way through, and I did a plain water with just aloe for my um, rooting gel, and it actually rooted faster and it rooted better. So I'm, my, what's gonna happen as soon as I get home when I have some time is I'm actually gonna do a K and F clone versus our plain water. I'd like to do a third run with also chemical just so I can have Again, these control groups. 
Um, and I think it's really important. So like, you know, Kevin's saying it's about one thing, Suzanne is saying there's something else going on. Try it yourself and see. I mean, I traditionally cut mine, but I might try without. So. Not with, with the plain water. Um, again, healthy moms. If you're starting with a mom that's got issues, you're gonna have issues all the way through. There's just, you're not gonna be able to get away from that. Um, you know, Kevin's talking about calcium. That was something new for me, but my immediate thought goes to Korean natural farming. My immediate thought goes to water-soluble calcium phosphate or water-soluble calcium. I would not necessarily have added that to my cloning solution, but I'm glad I didn't start that. I'll do that when I get home and add that to my, my recipe, so to speak. I use um, fulvic acid as a, as a full nutrient, both in the, in the water cloners and I spray them. You know, once a day I'll give a little mist of fulvic acid. And um, when, they're, when they're rooted, um, and I, I want Kevin to talk about this because this is something him and I talked about before. So I also use water cloners and then I put them into soil and I actually grow them up inside the cloners using fulvic acid and I'll get, you know, a 12 inch top on them and then I'll cut the roots a little bit, I'll prune them, and then plant them in my soil. Um, Kevin's talked about, you know, there, there's, a, there's a shock point. Yeah, I mean, you want to elaborate on it? The, 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 the stereo coating of the root is determined by the environment that I'm starting in. So whenever you make a transition, there's going to be a stall. It's going to have to kind of adapt to that environment. And so I like water cloners for the expediency of the job. But the problem is that if you're trying to move clones in any quantity, People don't show up on time like they do in any business. So if you're selling a product, Tuesday becomes Wednesday, becomes Thursday, becomes Monday. And the problem is that you have to hold these things in this incredibly aggressive environment. And you can't, if you want to hold them for time, you have to up-pop them. And so once you start to up-pop clones, now you're talking a density of you know, 36 per, per uh, 11 by 22. So you went from a potential 100 density down to a lower density. And all of that is cost and space. So, and you're having to now change the tending practices and you're having to make sure that you keep track of these plants on a cyclical basis. So it makes it hard to use water cloners to feed a commercial operation unless you're gonna to go to an up pot operation where you have clients that wanna pick it up from you and say the one gallon form. And then you'd be able to go to threes and to that, that point and then deliver them plants at whatever size. But for water cloners for the personal use, they're phenomenal because it lets you blow roots right now and if your plant is in an extreme case of like juvenility, where you have high sugar levels in the, the material you're cloning, the speed of transition is quick. It, it, it's never slow. It's when it's more lignified. If you can't snap that plant cleanly off with no material stuck to it, where it doesn't just break clean, then it's going to be a much slower period. So as long as you're determining your carbohydrate levels correctly and you're saying snap, that is juvenile material, the transition speed of that is quick no matter what variety. I mean, there's, there's outlier varieties that never really take as quick as you'd like them to. The old Abbott Walker cut was an example. She was just really, really exceptionally hard to propagate. I think that's why you don't see it around. But if you just kind of make sure that that material is always in that level, then you're not gonna have to have the fade. And if you're running too much light over the top of them, you're gonna get a fade because they're gonna over, over photosynthesize. And you're gonna end up having this huge increase in callus. So that when you, you'll be increasing callus and you'll be pulling the sugar, but you won't get initiation. And so you're, you're, you're throwing too much energy at the plant to do it. All you need is survival energy. The plant's not going to really generate any photosynthesis because it doesn't have an uptake mechanism. So because we've cut that short, we're just working off the sink that's present. And the idea is not to burn the sugars up faster than my differentiated tissue converts. And once you get that rhythm, you'll figure it out. And then you're going to find that it's going to be different with different cultivars. And you're just going to write it down in your journal so that you can actually put together your propagation schedule a little more accurately because they're not going to all strike at the same time, and they're all going to have different needs. And so when you're doing your own farm work, you're able to kind of select for that purpose. Josh and Kelly, do you guys want to introduce yourselves and talk about, do you guys do any cloning, or do you only see this? Um, I'm Kelly from Dragonfly, you're awesome. It's nice to see you all today. Um, yeah, we do clones. Um, we do primarily seeds. But if we're going to pull clone, clones, um, often actually our cloning is at the very end of the cycle. Um, meaning that, you know, we see all of the plants and the varietals and sort of what we like and what plants have worked. And we may even take some uh, cuttings the day that we take down the plant 
because we feel like, yeah, it's shown its full potential, and this is something that we really want to keep on our property. So anytime that we're cloning, we're really going to be cloning, number one, for biological intelligence, meaning that that plant did really well in our environment, and maybe it was a pheno that we're you know, purposely looking for. So it's a little bit more of a challenging cloning um, procedure when you take the cuttings, you know, when the plant is that mature. So what has always worked for us is, um, you know, clones, clones are being taken from a mother plant and they already had like incredible amounts of nutrients pumping through them and then you're really isolating them from the mother source. So when you're isolating a plant from the mother source like that, you really want to think about what it was getting before, you know, in its nutrient value from the mother um, to, you know, what it needs when it starts to be cut. And I think the importance is minerals, you know. I know that Kevin, you touched on that. Um, but what we utilize a lot is trace minerals. There's a lot of liquid trace minerals out there. Um, and then it really gives the opportunity for before the plant shoots out a root, then it already knows that it has all of the optimal minerals for it to grow and for it to root out. So, you know, we love aloe, we love nettle tea, and uh, we use liquid minerals. Another thing we like is um, to either use soil blockers or some kind of a peat puck can be good, but we don't want to use any kind of uh, cloning gels or anything because it has, a lot of times, has fungicides in it and we want our roots to come out in a biological way that's, they're super furry and fuzzy, so we'll often put um, a, a layer of soil on the bottom of the tray and then put some kind of a puck or some kind of a medium that we choose on top of the soil, and then the, the soil that we use on the bottom can have a little bit of mycorrhizal fungi in there or some kind of a, a super light nutrient or um, a worm casting or something, so when the root comes out of the the puck or the clone or something uh, out of the, the rooting medium, it can go into the to the soil and then start you know pulsing nutrients out of there, and that just starts off the biological um, response and the roots faster. And then when you get your timing right and you go to transplant, then those roots are kind of in the soil already, so it makes the transition really pretty easy. And we're um, not doing you know uh, it commercially; it's what works on our farm. And we're also really careful about getting um, clones from uh, production clone places because of the, the factor of extracts and the potential of um, failing tests. So it's extremely important that you know where your clones come from and um, whether they've been tissue cultured and cleaned up or, or whatever. So we, that we try and do all of our own cloning from our own seeds and then propagate the strains that work best on our land. So that's just what we do. So Steve, do you want to introduce yourself again, I guess, and um, talk about aquaponics and cloning? Sure, so um, I was actually going to mention, so I, I'm Steve, most of you saw my presentation a little earlier, I do aquaponics. Um, I was actually going to mention, so when I was younger, I used to do cloning, my grandmother taught us, we take the new cuttings off of willows, we steep that in sunflower oil or coconut oil, and we could extract it, make our own home organic, you know, cloning gel. Um, the one that I personally like to use for cloning in aquaponics systems is called Olivia's cloning gel. It's certified organic. It's OMRI certified, so you can actually use it, you know, with whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, I found that there isn't really any issues with PGRs, at least cloning PGRs with aquaponics. Or with fish and all, they seem to not affect fish health, at least in any study that I'm aware of. Um, but it um, doesn't mean you should go use all of them, you know, by any means. But, uh, you know, there's no evidence, at least in terms of fish, um, that there's an issue. So. But uh, the other way think you can do uh, cloning on aquaponics is just taking the plants and putting them in media beds. And the flood and drain action actually works really good for cloning, especially things like trees. In Jamaica, we do a lot of cloning of moringa trees. That way, we would just take cuttings <coughs> and put them in media beds and, and clone them that way, so. You can pop an avocado seed in like 14 days. I haven't done, a, I haven't done avocado from seed. Oh, I've done as much and quite just shove them in there and they come up, boom, trees. Can I ask a question? Uh, climate control, like, how do you let's the, let's get it from you know all three of you guys, the water, Kevin, and Josh and Kelly. What do you? What's your climate? Do you for root zone for temperature domes? Like, how do you? Well, technical stuff. Well, the way we oh we were conventional for a long time. So like right now, my my process is different because I receive plants that are coming in from a tissue culture facility. 
So they're coming in in a, in a plantlet form, and then what I have to do is I have to stabilize their environment in that situation, which is a little more humid and a little more buffered. But when traditionally, I, I would look for at least, you know, 78, 82 is a sweet spot for the bottom end on, on root growth. And so you have to be cautious because the, the lights are gonna heat up the interior of the tray also, and it's gonna throw it into the mid 90s. But if you get down lower than that, you're not getting enough chemical activity and the, and the speed is slowed down. So there has to be a warm, humid environment. I would prefer to use a room that was climactically controlled, and now we have those where we can have ultrasonic misters go blow through a facility. But I didn't have that luxury at my, my last number of adventures. They would basically use what you had in front of you. And well, we weren't allowed to get permits on a lot of it, so if we made any building changes on a lot of the things we did, we would have validated the permit. So what happens is you kind of have to figure out how to use the tools you have in front of you. And making the mistakes that you make in that process is valuable because you get to see the real life of it. And humidity domes work really well for people that don't have an ability to climatically control a space. And if you don't have the infrastructure to create the environment in that that works for you, and you just want to do small scale propagation, then that's a fine method. You just have to make sure that you're having enough transfer through so that you're not getting excessive transpiration inside the dome.